Today on the podcast, we have Tristan Kalama. Thanks for having me. And I slid into his DMs. Wait, what? Oh, yeah. I was too handsome. I just needed to know if the grass was green over there. <laughs> I love talking to people, but then I'm drained after doing it. And I was like, come on, I can like talk to a rock. And <laughs> he's looking. very extroverted. He's very extroverted. Yeah. I was ready to like go into more debt. Like, what do you need? I'll give you my firstborn child. Like, let's do this. There are so many vacant homes here in Hawaii. I don't think the one answer is building sky rises and calling them, you know, affordable housing condos. I am money motivated and there's nothing wrong with that, but like I felt nothing. I'm like, something's really wrong. In fact, I'm actually really depressed and sad. If your dreams don't scare you, <laughs> to say them out loud, then they're too small. Hi, welcome to our podcast. I'm your host, Shaolin. This podcast is all about the human experience and the stories we tell. If you want to keep updated on the latest episodes, hit the subscribe button. Let's begin. Today on the podcast, we have Tristan Kalama. She's a real estate investor and co-host of HGTV's Renovation Aloha, alongside her husband, Kamohai Kalama. Together, they breathe new life into properties on Oahu while balancing their roles as parents to two kids, Yasael and Vale. Tristan manages the renovations, Kamohai identifies the properties, and they find perfect families to move into the newly transformed homes. They also share their real estate expertise on their podcast, Deals in Aloha. Tristan, I'm so happy you're here. <laughs> Thanks for having me. I think what's really fun is that we've known each other for years. For years. Like, what year? We met at like, one of my projects. Did we meet before I had kids or after? Maybe. I think you had kids. I had already. kids. Okay. Yeah. So it's been like right before 2020. Yeah. So at least that's five years. Crazy. I know. Yeah. So when we met, I think I met you on your first. It was, Flip, right? no, it was our second, okay. it was our second ever, yeah. that, which is crazy. It's so crazy. Yeah. And, um, through the realtor mm -hmm. brought you in because mm -hmm. we were at the tail end and needed to stage it. Yes. And I think you and I, we actually didn't even work together on that house, but we no, vibed. Too expensive. <laughs> yeah. You were too expensive for me, but we vibed. Yes. Yeah. And I was like, oh my gosh, there's a fellow woman, <laughs> yeah. business person, yeah. entrepreneur. Like I could tell from the moment we met that we were yeah. so alike and so many ways totally and that has just proven to be true throughout yep. the five years which has been so insane. when we can sprinkle in coffee dates yes. here and there yeah yeah yeah, yeah. and that is mainly <laughs> just text messages like ah. yeah, yeah. Yeah. yeah just like that <laughs> exactly yeah it's been fun yeah know, and a lot of life has happened so much life for both happened. of us yeah <laughs> i know it's and crazy it's so crazy and it's so fun to think that we have each other on this journey and i'm always so grateful for it i know yeah and okay. we're sitting and this didn't exist five years ago <laughs> I know. I know. It's so wild to think about. But I want to start yes. from the beginning. Okay. From your childhood. Oh, God. <laughs> kind of like, what was your childhood like? Yeah. Kind of what were the values that you got? Mm. I mean, I feel like I know you as a as a woman now. I want to, I feel like your childhood is always such a reflection of who you are as a person. Absolutely. So love to hear like a little bit about that. Yeah. Okay. So, um, well, first of all, I'm born and raised in Kailua. Um, I came from a super loving home, but it wasn't without its trials. Um, both my parents were entrepreneurs, so I was just immersed in that. I knew nothing else. And they also worked together mm -hmm. like my, my whole life. So it's ironic now that, right, I work with my husband, but I think that was also ingrained. So it just came natural. Mm -hmm. Um... My parents had some some trouble where they had to go away for a minute. And um, so I had to live with my grandparents. And I'm so blessed. Like, my grandmother and my grandfather were huge influences in my life and had stability and, like, showed me the real definition of what love is because they were married for, like, ever. <laughs> Six, like together years like you know there's a 20 yeah. yeah like and you know they live through Pearl Harbor and they're both from here yeah it was just crazy and um so yeah but my grandfather was also an entrepreneur so it was just like in my blood yeah. you know what I yeah. mean um but my parents are the true definition of perseverance hard work love they're happily married i think when um you go through a lot of families when they go through what we went through which is substance abuse and incarceration 
they don't come out on the other end of that stronger as the family unit and my family did. And I think there's so many things that go into that. My grandparents being one of them as a showing support and stability for our family as we went through this like major shift. And I think spirituality played a huge component in my parents' ability to stay married, bring our family back together and come out stronger as a unit. So so yeah, I mean, that made me who I am. It gave me a lot of masculine energy because I had to, I had to grow up quick, right? Mm-hmm. I had to survive, mm-hmm. even though I still had love in the home, but it made me who I am today. And I think as an adult, it laid this framework for me to never give up, to go after. And that's one thing I contribute to my dad too, is because He, they always were like, go for it Mm -hmm. and made me believe that I could do anything that I wanted to do. And like, I don't know if a lot of, I know children get that, but like, I got that in my home, no matter what we went through. It was like, I love you. You can do whatever you want to do and do it. Mm -hmm. So I think that's probably why I am where I am today (laughs) because of that. Yeah. Yeah, I love that. And I think it's also interesting because... Fast forward, yeah. you started, because your first career, when did you start the nonprofit? Was that like right away or? So, yeah. So I, after, you know, my family went through what they went through, my parents, my dad was still an entrepreneur and my mom were, worked as a counselor. And okay. so they were both in this nonprofit sector and in the counseling sector. So I naturally graduated from Cullet Hill High School and went straight into college for psychology. It was just like, I didn't even think about it. It's just what I did. So I got my bachelor's in psych and then I went straight into grad school and I got my, um, geez, what is it called? Master's in counseling psych or something. <laughs> You're like, what is that thing I got? What did I do? <laughs> yeah. And um, I immediately started working for my mom at a residential substance abuse treatment center. That's where, and I worked there for a couple years straight into college. And then I went and worked for my dad because he was building the nonprofit side of his business and he had new grants and contracts. And I was like, okay, let's go over here. And then that's where I got the opportunity to take over a nonprofit in like, 2014, okay. 2015 is when my best friend from college and I, we just went for it. We just took it over and I started writing grants and getting contracts and we just built it to into what it is today. And it's really cool. But then I found real estate in 2018 and I was like, hey girl, I really want to go into this. I feel like I'm being drawn in this direction. And it's almost, again, one of those spiritual things where you're like, I feel like this is where I'm supposed to be. And I just need to walk into that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So how did you meet Kamohai? When did you meet him? And how did you guys meet? I met Kamohai when I was doing my practicum in grad school. Okay. And I was like, mom, I need practicum hours. So just let me, I was already working for my dad. Mm -hmm. Um, And... He, my mom was his boss. Okay. So he was a counselor there and I would have to come in. I came in after I was done with work and on my days I didn't have grad school and I would sit at her desk and she would have me do a bunch of stuff, you know, and his desk was right across from her desk. So we would just stare at each other. And I don't even remember the year, like honestly. Um, but I think we've been together for like 10 years, 11 years, something like that. Mm-hmm. Married, married for eight. Okay. So do the math. Yeah. Um, and I slid into his DMs. Wait, what? Oh yeah. Wait, why didn't you just talk to him? We, we talked because it was weird. I don't know. My mom was, <laughs> my mom was his boss and the culture there is very like no relationships. Mm. Don't, I'm, but it wasn't like, it was for clients, but in a residential treatment center, that's very strict. Like. I was hands off and he'll even tell you that like when I initially walked into the office years before we ever met, he noticed me. I didn't notice him because I was in a relationship at the time and everyone told him that's the boss's daughter. Don't talk to her. So that was kind of the framework of that situation. And then, and then when I came back and I was working for my mom, I, I was single and I was in a place to notice him. And he was very much noticed. Yeah. And my mom... He's very, giant. How he, tall is he? He's 6'4". And how tall are you? I'm 4'11". 
It's funny, right? It's so funny. When I see you guys together, I'm like, wait, what? You should have seen us on our first and second dates. I remember we were walking to the movie center. It was our second date. And um, we were crossing the street. And I'm just talking normal, right? And he's bending down to try and hear what I'm saying because I'm not used to talking up like it. It was pretty funny. But yeah, I sent to his DMs and I, I had never done that before in my entire life. What compelled you to finally do it? I was too intrigued and he was too handsome. I just needed to know if the grass was green over there. <laughs> See, and my like, mom kind of gave me the approval. I okay. think I needed that too. Was It was like, no, he is a really good person. He has a really good family. And I was like, oh, okay. So you're just like, hey. Yeah. And he was like, hey. <laughs> Yeah, and then it just I gave him my number, I think, okay. and I said, um, "Text me." And we, then he tried to impress me by going on our first date to the Outrigger Canoe Club. Okay, but I was like, "Oh, I've been a member here since I was like five. And he's like, "What?" I'm like, yeah. yeah. So we we went on our first date and hung out every day ever since. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I love that. And so you were doing kind of the nonprofit thing. Mm -hmm. He had a store, right? Yeah. He was doing re men's surf inspired high end retail clothing with his brother Kahana, who's in lives in San Diego. So they had retail stores on this street. Yeah. Hikili street. And then in San Diego and then Ala Moana. And what, what ended up happening where he no they no longer wanted to do that business? Like it was just a I think Kahana was being pulled in other opportunities and directions and then also brick and mortar just got really hard. Mm -hmm. Um the cost of maintaining the store just got too expensive and I think you don't know what you don't know. Like mm -hmm. now, hindsight's twenty twenty, if I if we knew what we knew now in business, like that store would be very profitable. But I think everything happens for a reason because if that store was super profitable and we were doing really, really well, we probably wouldn't have made the jump to go into real estate. So, right. Yeah. So I feel like this is kind of well documented, but I do want to talk about it how yeah. you saw the commercial, right? Yes. For real estate investing. Yeah. What was the feeling you got or what made you say? Because I mean, I feel like we always see things all the time. We're like, oh, that's a good idea. Yeah. yeah like that is yeah. interesting. But like, what pulled you where you're like, yeah. We're doing this. So from 2016 to 2018, we got married. We had two children. I was grinding away at the nonprofit. He was grinding away at Beach Club. And I think once you bring beautiful human beings into the world, you start thinking a little bit differently. And we were struggling. Like we were in debt. We were living paycheck to paycheck. We were renting. Um, there were some months I needed help from family to even make ends meet. And I was like, I, this can't be how my life is going to be, mm -hmm. you know, like I've worked, I imagined a different life for myself and something inside of me said that I was meant for more and I needed to be doing something. Like I was missing a piece to a puzzle that was like almost complete, but there's a section I don't have. Mm -hmm. And I, I was literally sitting on a couch with my son, breastfeeding him, like, feeling like I just need something and something's missing. And I saw this commercial and real estate has always been in the back of my mind because my great grandfather owned a ton of real estate, sold a lot of it and was able to bless his children with property. Mm -hmm. And that was my Nana. And I saw what it did for, for them and how it gave them a, a leg up to actually pursue some of their dreams mm -hmm. and have financial abilities to do things. Mm -hmm. And my dad was a realtor. I saw him get his commercial building and what that did. Now it's his retirement. So I'm like, I know there's something to this real estate thing, but like, what am I supposed to be doing in it? Yeah. And I saw the commercial. And again, I feel like it's a spiritual thing. I just, I was so sick of my own situation that I didn't even think what if I just went. Mm -hmm. And I think that's what happens a lot of times. You have to get sick and tired of your situation and be at the end of it in order to make a change. Totally. Yeah. So when you guys went to that conference, because you obviously are driving Kamohai along. Yeah. He's not. Very skeptical. He's very like, uh, whatever. Yeah. So you guys are there. Was there a certain thing that was said or like a certain aha moment that made you guys be like, okay, let's look into this and like, let's do it. For me, I was eating up every second of every minute. And I was like, I don't, they could be feeling me complete bullshit right now, but I didn't care. I yeah. wanted to do it. Yeah. I think for my husband... 
it was seeing somebody that was born and raised here that looked like him, that talked like him. And even for me to seeing people come up that are from Hawaii that were working W-2s and still being able to invest in real estate with mm-hmm. none of their own money was a huge component. I just needed the information because I'm very... Can you tell me what to do? I'm going to follow that and I'm going to do that. Right. But we didn't leave that seminar signed up for a mentorship or anything because my husband was like, wait, because I was ready to like go into more debt. Like, what do you need? I'll give you my firstborn child. Like, let's do this. The one that's still breastfeeding. You can have the second one. I was pumping in the bathroom that whole seminar. It's crazy. Crazy. And, um, But something resonated, right? Something, a a seed was planted at that seminar and I left there actually feeling kind of frustrated because I was ready to go all in and my other half, my life partner wasn't. And it wasn't for a couple weeks until he did a lot of research on his own that I didn't even know he was doing and called the mentorship or this like seminar back and was like, okay, you laid out these options, but I don't like any of those options. So true and true negotiator, right? He's like, what other options do you have? And he negotiated a cheaper deal, which was for less, that was like six months or something. And that's what we ended up doing a few weeks later. And then we just did that program for six months. Okay. So it was like a full program that kind of taught you guys how to do everything you're going to do. So you get out of the program. Yeah. Then what? (laughs) Then like, how did you guys end up setting it up to where, like how you guys get out and you're like, okay, you're better at negotiating. Like how, what was your first step? Well, I literally just followed what they told me, honestly. And they said, go find a realtor that, and tell them this is exactly what you want to do. That's open to helping you. And Mm -hmm. I immediately thought of a childhood she, my parents gave her one of her first jobs. And so, and she like babysat me when I was little and I knew that she was in real estate. And so I met up with her. They make you create this packet, this credibility packet. And I went and I said, here, her name is Jocelyn. I said, Jocelyn, this is what I want to do. And the hopes is that we can um, buy a home this way. You can actually, cause that's, that's what my heart wanted to do. I always envisioned living and owning property in where I was born. Mm-hmm. And that's Kailua. Mm-hmm. And, um, she said, okay. And I said, start sending me the shittiest houses you can find on the MLS. The ones that say need major re- repair contractor special, all this stuff. Mm-hmm. So she just started sending them to us. We started making offers on them. And one thing left to another after months of doing that, we ended up getting our first project. Oh my gosh. Okay. So you get your first project. Mm -hmm. You've never been in construction before. Never. So, (laughs) so what, how did you tackle it? Like, what did you, cause obviously you ended up designing Mm -hmm. and and picking everything and, Mm -hmm. and you kind of, in that project, did you kind of become the renovation gal and he became like the deals person or. So in the very beginning, we were doing everything together and there was tons of conflict, tons of fighting, (laughs) tons of my ways better and so and then everything stopped because we were both picking out tile we were both doing mm-hmm. this we were both doing everything mm-hmm. so while we were renovating one project no marketing was happening we weren't trying to get another deal um and it just made things 10 times harder but again hence it's always 2020 right. so we ended up figuring out through our first couple of deals that okay you're better at this because in my line of work prior to real estate, I was the one talking to people. I was the one counseling. I was the one, you know, at the forefront solving problems and trying to help people. And I was kind of burnt out from that. And so, and he is just way more patient of a person than I am. So he just naturally gravitated to that, the marketing side and talking to sellers and all of that. And I just naturally gravitated to the other side and that's just how that happened. It was very organic, but we read a book called Rocket Fuel, and I think that helped solidify it for us. Rocket Fuel talks about having um, a visionary and an integrator in any successful business. And while we both fall on the visionary side of things, I was well more equipped because of my nonprofit work to be the more integrator side and the more paperwork side and the behind the scenes side. Mm-hmm. But I was kind of, it was refreshing to not have to talk to people every day. <laughs> so, yeah. yeah. 
Yeah. Okay. So you guys kind of set up this amazing situation. How many homes had you had done when the production company oh, man. approached you guys? I should know this number. Well, like how many years were you in, I guess we should say. We've been in it since 2018. We got okay. approached three years ago. Okay. So it's 2024 now, yeah. 23, 22, 21. We got approached, I think, either end of 2020, beginning of 2021. Okay. To do a show. Right. And they slid, they slid into our emails and I saw it. Um, and the memo was like, I don't know, like, um, television show in Hawaii or something. And I didn't click on it and I didn't I acknowledge that it was even there for a while because I thought if I clicked on it, it was going to be a virus. And I'm serious. Yeah. It was never a yeah. goal. It was never, I hope to be on TV one day. Like right. that has never, I was just wanting to not struggle. Yeah. I wanted to own a home and have create wealth for my family. So I just ignored it for a while but then this production company was sourced from hgtv right to go and try and get talent yeah which is weird i'm not i'm not talent i'm a human to get talent a uh, husband and wife team doing real estate in hawaii that does enough volume to be able to create a show and right. so they were i think once you're in the real estate um, community here in whatever capacity, whether it's realtor, investor, and you're actually doing a certain amount of deals, the community gets smaller. So they were talking to a bunch of our friends, you mm -hmm. know, our people that mm -hmm. we were associated with. Mm -hmm. And then they came back and um, a lot of our friends were like, no, you need to talk to this production company. They started referring them back to us. And I was like, okay, I guess I should look at this email. So I clicked on the email and then I reached out to our mentor um, Pace Morby at the time. And I was like, cause he just started filming a show oh. for A&E. Oh. And I was like, how do I know that this production company is even real? You right. know what I mean? And he was yeah. like, you know, go check on their IMBP, <laughs> you know? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And I was like, okay. Cause you can see, it's kind of like their resume mm -hmm. for whatever they've done. Mm -hmm. I was like, okay, well, it looks like they're legit. And he's like, just give it a shot. Go and respond to the email and like see what happens. And so Zooms led to more Zooms, led to scissor reels, led to uh, act ones, like all this stuff. And then we finally got greenlit and started filming season one in 2022. No, we filmed our pilot in 2022 and we filmed all of last year, 2023. So what has surprised you the most about filming? Like when you were in the process Ugh. of filming? Because I think people don't know, right? Like unless no. you do it, you no. really have no idea. So I think this is a perfect opportunity to kind of give some people the reality of filming, what that's like. Yeah. And then also, too, if you've never imagined being on TV, like, it's so vulnerable. It's so vulnerable. It's so vulnerable to be on TV. Yes. To put your kids on TV. It's very scary. Uh, yeah. So scary. Yeah. So what made you kind of commit to doing it, mm -hmm. feeling like, okay, this is something our family wants to do? Yeah. Like, that whole no. thing. Well, first of all, it was not a light decision that we made. I think he and I really talked about it and prayed about it for a long time before ever committing. And people are like, oh, you've been working on this for so long. People don't understand the development and what goes in and the phases of getting a TV show actually greenlit. There's one thing of having all of this prep work, and then you could get told no, you know, and um so I didn't know that. I had no idea even what it took to do a TV show. So everything was new. If you think something is going to take two hours, it's actually going to take five hours. If you think it's going to take five hours, it's going to take 10 hours. You know, you have to be really open to sharing your life in a way that you never thought before. And you have to develop tough skin. You have to have a lot of support from your, your system of people that are your framework for support. Because if you don't have that, it's very easy to get overwhelmed. And so if we didn't have, you know, family to help us with watching the kids, picking up the kids. Cause when you're filming, you're yeah. filming from like 7am to 7pm, you know? Um, there was just so much that was a first for us. And I think what was really important to us was let's do this show. We never did the show 
for notoriety. In fact, I, <laughs> it's very hard even today. I appreciate everyone that comes up to us and says, oh my God, I love your show. I recognize you from your show. Like it's an amazing feeling to be received that way because you're putting yourself out there. But I'm such not an extroverted person a hundred percent of the time. I'm kind of like in the middle. You have introvert, extrovert, and I'm in the middle. There's, I love talking to people. I love helping people, but then I'm drained after doing it. And I need to revert back to my like, room where I, it's quiet and I'm alone you know what I mean mm-hmm, so I mm-hmm. kind of fall very much in the middle and I can go either way but whereas come on I can like talk to a rock and <laughs> yeah he's me. very extroverted he's very extroverted he's very extroverted uh, the show just came out so we're mm-hmm. still learning new things about this whole process and all of that but uh, at the end of the day we did the show to grow our business and to impact more um And that was really, if we can do the show in order to get where we're trying to go quicker, then that's, that's the end game. It was never to be like, oh, I'm famous because I'm not into that in any way, you know, like I just want to be able to get to where I'm going quicker. If I can expedite that and help more people along the way, the TV show would be a great way to do that. Well, perfect. You led me into my next question, which is where are you going? <laughs> where am I going? What's your goal? Like, What's where, goal? What, where are you saying to get to me quicker? Like, what is that? I think, think empire. Yeah. Think big. I think that throughout the way of learning about myself and um, what I want to do, no, if your dreams don't scare you <laughs> to say them out loud, then they're too small. So a lot of the stuff I have in my mind scare the complete shit out of me, you know? Um, but one of them is we're starting a retail construction company to service retail clients with my brother and my sister-in-law. Um, that's like in the works. What does that mean? Like what is retail construction? Well, we get a lot of questions and like people reaching out, like, can you renovate my house mm-hmm. now? And the answer was no mm-hmm. for a long time mm-hmm. because A, we didn't have capacity and B, that's not what we do. Yeah. You know, we're, we're investors. We buy properties to renovate them and sell them for a profit. You know, mm-hmm. I don't deal with retail clients like you do. That's like not my cup of tea. Yeah. But I said, why are we doing that? Is it just because you're scared? Like, or because the margins for retail construction are, are good. Mm -hmm. So, and my brother has so much knowledge and Mm -hmm. skill set from being a journeyman carpenter that's not being utilized. Yeah. You know, it is being utilized as our project manager, but we can 10x what we're doing right now. Right. And instead of saying no, why, why, but let's say yes. Yeah. So if people come and they want that little renovation, a little flair for me, you know, and they Mm -hmm. want to renovate their bathroom, like, why are we saying no? Let's Mm -hmm. say yes. So that's something that we're doing actively. We're going to start doing more. Um, I want to, I want to white label products. I want to bring the stuff that I love that is it here? Mm-hmm. Like I don't, I don't want to go to Home Depot and Lowe's for tile. Mm-hmm. You know, like, I want to bring it here and white label it and be able to provide that um, education. I know that that was a huge thing for Kamai and myself. It was like that was the main component that made us sign up for this mentorship that changed our entire world. Was that there was somebody that looked like me, talked like me, was from here, and proved to me that they could do it because they were doing it. Mm-hmm. And I think that needs to be here in Hawaii because every good mentorship right now, you have to go to the mainland for it or they're mainland based um, for real estate investing. Wait, what about the one that you did? It's no longer here. That they were never here. Oh, he just happened to be they from here originally. They were just doing a seminar here, and then the guy that joined it years ago was from here and did the program, but he lived here, and he, he that's what they do, right? They bring somebody up that's from here, yeah. Got it, got it, got it. Yeah. Okay, yeah. got it. So I would like to, and and <clears throat> what do we specialize in? We specialize in fix and flip investing. So I would just want to teach people how to do that because that's really what changed our entire life where we were able to generate enough income to pay off all of our bad debt and then own our home. Mm -hmm. We live in one of our projects that we kept, you know what I mean? And like, I've seen what the power of being able to do that can do for a family. And so I want to teach more people how that they can do that in an expensive market where we live is Ash, the number one most expensive place to live, I think, right now. Yeah. In the nation. Yeah. So people think they can't do it. And Mm -hmm. I'm like, "Mm, you can. Mm -hmm. You just need to change the lens that you're looking through. Could someone do it just 
like one or two times and change their whole life get to get profit and then move on to something else like you're saying like you can do it it doesn't have to be this like long term. No, you don't, you don't have, have to, to do it like me. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, you don't have to like do a bajillion houses. No, yeah, and make I, it a whole business. You could literally just do it on a the couple side. times. Absolutely, and that's like what you want to do is like you want to get those people who are just doing it a couple times, mentor them, create a program for so them, whatever they want to do. I just yeah. want people to know what's possible because a lot of what's being told. And it's generationally is that you are only going to hit this ceiling and you can't bust past that Mm -hmm. or you'll never be afford to do. You'll never afford to do that. Mm -hmm. I just want to show people that they actually can if they want to. And here's how you can. And it's up to you to apply that skill set that you now know about. And take it to whatever level you want to take it to. If you want to take it to my level, let's go. If you want to do one or two. And change your whole life. Because, I mean, you could flip a condo and make anywhere from thirty to $50,000. That's someone's entire salary that they just added on. Yeah. Imagine what that could do for for a person. You know what right. I mean? Right. Yeah. I love that. Well, I think it speaks so much to you and Kamo High about how much you guys are willing to share your experience. And I know that wasn't the case when you guys were getting into the business. You couldn't really find other no. real estate investors who are willing to mentor you guys or really help you. So yeah. I think it's amazing that... You've been able to make so much success and then give that to other people and, and be want, willing to share because I think that's yeah. really rare. I know what it's like to be in like a new field multiple times, even in the nonprofit, being a young female in this very male dominated old school way. And mm-hmm. it's very similar in real estate where it's very male dominated and it's the cool, cool boys club. Like mm-hmm. if you're in, you're in. If you're not, you're not. So I just know what that felt like. And I know the rejection that we got. Like, I remember if there were some meetups that were held, but you had to have done deals in order to even be invited. And it's like, well, how am I going to learn how to do deals if I'm not even invited to the table? So once we got some traction and had some proof of concept, not a ton, we're like, we're going to do the opposite and make sure people don't feel how we felt. Because we were very told don't do it. There's too much competition. You're going to fail. You bought a bad deal. Like all of this stuff was super negative. And when you're in a new industry, that's very scary to be told. But luckily we're both hard headed. And again, masculine energy. I'm like, yes, tell me that I'm going to prove you wrong. Yeah. Challenge accepted. Yeah, exactly. (laughs) Challenge accepted. Check. Yeah. Um, but I think that was the motivation was like, I don't want anyone to feel how we felt. And if we can create more, environments where more people feel a part of it and more relationships and networking can take place openly, then that's how you create more impact for your community. You know what I mean? And ultimately, if you're just on this journey to do it alone and make all your money and be greedy, like you're not going to be in it for a long, the long haul. And I want to be in this for the long haul. Yeah. Yeah. So I don't know if you can really speak to this, but I'd love to touch on it a little bit because I feel like you're closer to the to the real estate I mean you're in the real estate world but like the housing crisis Mm -hmm. situation that's going on here I feel like it needs to be like a government thing where they put something because it's getting so insane and so crazy yeah do you have any thoughts on like how that can be like how do we solve this problem yeah I I feel like oh man the homeless situation but also just like middle middle income families yeah can't afford homes like how do we as a society as a community or our government impose rules like is it about imposing rules is it about changing laws like what is it really about i think it's a super multifaceted in-depth problem that has to be addressed on so many different levels the first thing that comes to mind is um the permitting system the oh, lovely yeah. permitting system. I feel like they're, it's archaic. It's dinosaur. There's a lot of rules and regulations that need to be changed. I think they need to increase salaries within that department so we get qualified staff that will retain their employment there for longer than six months. And then that will allow for our processing times to decrease. And if our processing times decrease, then what I think they're missing is that they'll make more money quickly, which will then help whatever they're trying to pay for. Um, And it will allow for more circulation of money within our community because what they're missing is that 
owners that are hiring construction companies are hiring trades, which are hiring employees, which are it, the net that's cast from doing renovation is so wide. And that's all local people working. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? So that's one thing. The second thing is there are so many vacant homes here in Hawaii. There's so many distressed vacant homes that are sitting there with no local families in there. None. They're just sitting, rotting. I think there needs to be something addressed there. Not these, I I don't think the one answer is building sky rises and calling them, you know, affordable housing condos. I don't think that's the only answer. What about all these thousands of vacant homes that you'll see on the show sitting there for 20 years with nobody in them? Like if rules were loosened and then there were more assistance for people to buy these distressed properties, Mm -hmm. that's something we can now bring back into market for a local family to live in. Whereas before it was just sitting there vacant, contributing to the housing crisis. Mm -hmm. So I think there's something there. I think, you know, there was that foreign, don't allow anybody that's not from (laughs) here. I don't know if that's the answer, but I think taxing them is the answer. Yeah. Incentivize people to not buy here if they don't want to pay the tax. Right. You know, tax those people much higher instead of taxing local people. Um, Yeah, that's just a few of my thoughts. (laughs) I was just thinking as you're saying this, I'm like, would you ever run for anything no i told kamai to do it <laughs> oh yeah and you could just be the brain child no, I'm just you'll be the chief of staff <laughs> behind no, i don't think so i think our mission is more with with actually the people yeah you know but yeah. i i see us as a community i think we need to be more vocal i think we do need to step up and say things and i i also want to say that we as a race as people born and raised here need to be careful with the words that we use because they're so 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 powerful and if we're told and we tell our children and our relationship with money is tainted it spreads generationally so if our parents we saw them struggle and had this relationship with money or it's like no we can't afford that we can't afford that we we can't afford that what is it going to do to your child no i can't afford that i can't afford that what if we just change one word instead of saying, I can't afford that? It's like, well, what can I do to be able to afford that? Mm-hmm. You know, I think that that's something that we've emphasized a lot because words are powerful. It changes the way you think. And if it changes the way you think, it changes the way you act. And if you change the way you act, then you actually are creating change. Um, and so instead of saying, I can't afford that, let's say, how can we as a local people afford that? And me and Kamaya believe so strongly, it's like, if we control the land, he's a native Hawaiian, I'm born and raised here. If we control more of the land, we control who buys the land. Mm -hmm. And I can't change 20, 50, 100 years of what happened. What happened was wrong, but I'm, I, that's, I'm, I'm probably going to catch hate for this, but like, I don't think Hawaii is ever going to get turned over and the United States is not going to be involved. Like, I don't see that. I think that's safe to say. Changing. But what we can change is what we do in the here and now. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And that's the the point of view that we come from. Well, what can we do right now? Mm -hmm. I can buy vacant homes. I can help families that are in financial distress. I can educate people and I can take back control of land. If I'm able to take back control of land, I control who gets the land. Mm Mm-hmm. Yeah, and I think there's so much power in that. Yeah. I do think, yeah, it's a complicated situation. Super. You know, I had someone in here the other day. He grew up in, like, the 70s and 80s here. And he said that it's so different now. Like, the aloha has changed. Totally. And he's, like, the respect of your elders and just the way people treat each other. And I think there's so much in our community right now that's so fear-based. Yeah. And it's so quick to be mean to each other and so quick to throw daggers at each other but instead it's like why don't we all just come together and solve the problem together as a community and take care of each other like I remember my dad told me he was growing up here in the 60s there were no homeless people yeah everyone had a home if not you were taken in by family or friends or someone who knows someone everyone knew each other yeah there was no such thing as a homeless person Mm. and now like we like now we say houseless, but the houseless community is ginormous here. Mm-hmm. It's insane. And yeah. it's only going to get worse unless we as community 
come together and figure it out. And I know that the government is trying to do something, but I also think it's so much about the community. Mm -hmm. Like, you know, those people who are able to change the dynamic in their family with the wealth can help, just like you and Kamal High are doing, right? Like, you changed your narrative, and now you're able to help. Well, it's a ripple effect, too. Mm -hmm. I also, I'm telling you, just the narratives that are pushed out are have a huge influence on the community. So it's like, it has to start at the top, where it's like, Let's start empowering people that they actually can do stuff to afford to live here instead of just being told that they're priced out. Mm -hmm. Do you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. It starts there. What about landlords that have property? Like, what if we actually incentivize them to have their rent be more affordable or to work with Section 8 or government-sponsored programs? Like, it has to start there. Right. Yeah. Yeah, totally. So I want to jump really quickly because you're such a busy person woman <laughs> I, know. I think we all just heard about <laughs> all the things that you want to do and all the things you want to accomplish and yeah. i feel like as a mom mm. as a wife as mm. a friend a daughter mm. all the roles that you have in your life like yeah. how do you manage it all like do you have any tools mm. do you have any things that keep you sane like when you need to be introverted like what what do, what do you do to mm. recharge and kind of keep going super good question I think hitting burnout was a huge thing for me to relearn and connect to myself to be more equipped to answer that question. (laughs) Um, I think I, it was two years ago. I hit major, major burnout. I had been in survival mode and so much masculine. I'm just going to conquer the world that I was so disconnected from my feminine side and what made me tick. And so a really, really powerful thing was connecting to a life coach, not even like a counselor per se, because I'm a freaking counselor. Like we're the hardest clients ever. <laughs> yeah. You're like, I know what you're trying to do here. Yeah. Like stop it. Yeah. Stop it. It's not going to work. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. So that was really, really game changing for me to get back to myself, mm-hmm. learn and actually heal from trauma. And I think a lot of entrepreneurs, we're the worst. We carry around the most baggage because we're, we don't know, we like to succeed our problems away. And if we succeed or we hit that goal, then I'll be okay. But what happens is we get there and we just move the goalpost and we're freaking miserable. And we thought that that external thing was going to make us happy. When in reality, it's all your peace and happiness and joy and self-esteem comes from within. So, and I had to learn that. I had to, and it's crazy, as a third, I think I was 31, had two children, had to relearn that I'm the shit. <laughs> Do you know what I mean? Yeah. Um, but I would encourage anybody to find that source, whether it's, I don't know, um, breathing and sound healing or whatever that is, or if it's a life coach, if it's a therapist, make the time. I see mine every Tuesday. <laughs> You're just like, no matter what. No matter what, yeah. because you don't want to get... I think I hit burnout the first year we made our first million dollar year, and I felt nothing. Nothing. And that's all I wanted, right? Right. I am money motivated, and there's nothing wrong with that, but like I felt nothing. And I'm like, something's really wrong. In fact, I'm actually really depressed and sad. And I knew that that was a red flag. And if you don't find joy in the process, that's a red flag. And so that's super important. And then when I'm feeling anxious, because when at any given time I can have anxiety with the bajillion things that are going on, I don't have it all figured out. I, I need to move my body. I need to move my body. And when I don't move my body, I'm a mess. Even if it's just like walking, like not Mm -hmm. running or like Mm -hmm. walking or get your arm thing, your, your weight out and just do a couple of these, like whatever it is, move your body because you need to release your body never lies to you. Mm -hmm. And, and during that time when I was hitting burnout, I was chronically sick. Yeah. Um, I'm pretty sure we connected over that. Like I was so, I was sick. I would get sick all the time. And it's your body trying to tell you like, wake the fuck up. Like things aren't okay. Your body remembers everything. So listen to your body. I had to learn how to like breathe again and really be in tune with that little girl that was still inside of me that went through everything it went through. Um, 
and get my strength from within. So I don't know if that even answered your question. No, it totally <laughs> did. What What do you think? Because you know therapy versus life coach. Like, mm. What do you think is the difference? How can someone decide between a life coach or a therapist? Um. Well, first of all, there's educational things that come into play, right? Usually therapists have gone to uh, six, eight years of schooling. They either have their doctorate or a licensure in some sort. Um, a life coach is more holistic, I think. And that's really what I was interested in because, okay. again, I went to the six, eight years of school. I got my licensure. I don't want you to talk to me about Maslow and stuff. You know, like I just want you to really take a different approach. Mm -hmm a more natural approach, <laughs> a more holistic approach. Yeah. Um, and that's what I did. And that's just what worked for me. But I would just tell anybody to find something that works for them. I love that. Yeah. So <clears throat> how does it feel? <laughs> oh, I don't know. This is also my this is a selfish question because I'm also curious. Yeah. Um, like, I think growing up here we're we're close in age i'm 36 yeah. you're i'm 33 okay yeah so growing up in hawaii i don't know if it was <laughs> just hawaii or if this is everywhere yeah but as women we were kind of told to like dim your light mm -hmm. stay in place don't shine too much mm -hmm. don't be like in front of the crowd mm -hmm. just blend in mm -hmm. like Share your gifts with everyone, but yeah. don't ever take credit, right? Mm -hmm. It's, like, very much the Asian yeah. philosophy, yeah. which I think works really well in a lot of ways. But I know that, for me, I had to unpack a lot of that, mm -hmm. especially when I started my business. And I was like, oh, my gosh, I have to put my name on this. Oh, my gosh, I have to put my face on my Instagram. Mm -hmm. Like, <gasps> <laughs> you know, and it kind of went against everything that yeah. I was told as a child. Yeah. Now you have a TV show. <sighs> yeah. You are, like, as exposed as one person could be mm. how does that feel and how does it not make you want to just like hide in your shell who says that it doesn't at times yeah you know what I mean I but I feel like that goes back to what we were just talking about and um being grounded and so solid in who you are and where you get your esteem and validation from mm -hmm. um and that it's from you. And I feel like when you're more confident in who you are and knowing you, then it makes all that other stuff easier. It doesn't make it go away because it does. And I'll probably talk to you in six months and say, oh, my God, I just went through this. And it was so hard. And I question everything because that's you're you're human. That's human mm -hmm. nature. Mm -hmm. But I think if you're always going back to your choices and believing your morals, your values, your compass that guides you, why you did something, why you didn't do something, and your like ultimate superpower as a woman, and you're like, you channel that and you always go back to that. It just makes navigating all this entrepreneurship <laughs> turbulent <laughs> water easier. And I think that we as women need to do that like every single day, <laughs> almost every single day. Cause yeah. I can't even tell you, like, you know, we have new episodes coming out every Tuesday. I wake up every Tuesday with anxiety because the do world, you, you talk to your life coach. So that's perfect timing. Like, right. Right. <laughs> yeah, I know. Like, perfect timing. I know. But it's like every Tuesday is another layer mm -hmm. of my life, mm -hmm. my business vulnerability peeled away. And how is it going to be perceived? Mm -hmm. But ultimately, and I think having su your support system around you is so critical. If I didn't have, you know, my in-laws and my parents and my brother and sister-in-law around me saying, fuck the noise. Right. We know what we do. It could get all the outside crap could get really, really loud. And mm -hmm. I think it's important to have boundaries and not and have a filter on who you let into your space and why. Mm -hmm. Because especially now when you have your face everywhere, a lot of people are going to want to reach out to you. A lot of people are going to want to connect with you. But if they don't have a filter, if they don't match and check these boxes, don't let them through. Because you had if you have to keep your support system really strong and almost small around you as you grow, I think in entrepreneurship, I'm not talking about business relationships, right? If they fit your uh, your long term goal with the men. Um, but your support system, and then, yeah, going back to 
like she just made me do this exercise last week. It's so funny. Um, this is what I'm talking about, like more holistic of like, where do you feel anxiety in your body? Mm -hmm. And okay, visualize that, pull it out, talk to it. Mm -hmm. And then um, it's almost like you're, because there's so many different parts of you as a human and your life experience that make you who you are. And I think as you're going through life and if you don't tend to them, um, they'll surface in other ways. So it's important to me touching and checking in on all these different parts of you. Mm -hmm. And my trauma and my pain is a huge part of me that always likes to surface its nasty, fucked up little head and try to take control, right? But if you ignore it, that's when things fester and things get out of control. So mm -hmm. it's like always checking in with that part of you, like you helped me get from this point of my life to this point of my life. And I thank you and I appreciate, but look, I've evolved and I have all these skill sets now that I don't need you to be in control anymore. And I'm going to take you, acknowledge you and put you somewhere else. Yeah. You know what I mean? Yeah. But I'm not forgetting you. Right. I love you. I'm not going to, I'm not getting rid of you. I'm not getting rid yeah. of you. I'm actually immersing you into this other whole mm -hmm, part of mm -hmm, it. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? Yeah. And then she was like, what, um, is like, if you had this superhero version or what is this, this like amazing, powerful version or woman that you look up to? And it was very surreal for me because it was me just like in the best version of me. You know, when your hair is feeling great and your makeup looks great, and your body looks great and you just feel great. Mm -hmm. That was her and channeling her and letting her drive and not the other parts of you that you've ignored drive. Yeah. If that makes sense. Yeah, totally. It's so funny because my therapist does the same thing. And I mm -hmm. think it's like training in like family systems. And yeah. I don't know what that training is called, but I I've know. heard many different people do that kind of yeah. parts and yeah. talking to your parts. And yeah. Like, yeah. I think it's like neuro linguistic programming kind of thing. Cause, yeah. Which is so fascinating to me. I've always like, I should have been a psychology major it's just like, oh, yeah. I love it so much. I yeah. love that kind of work. So I think also something happened to me the other day, and I, I think it's powerful for women like us because I think a lot of people look at us. I was just talking to my friend mm -hmm. and I was saying, oh my gosh, like doing this podcast, I feel so exposed. Like yeah. it's another layer of me that I never thought, mm -hmm. like I didn't realize how exposed I would feel just being the one asking questions. Yeah. And I was like, I'm kind of scared. Yeah. And she said, oh my gosh, it's so good to hear that you're scared because I look at you and you just do everything like fearless. Mm -hmm. And I was like, no, I'm terrified. Yeah. I just don't let that take control. Take control. Yeah. And I feel like you're similar in that Absolutely. way where it's like, it's okay to be terrified and it's okay to yep. not know if it's going to work out and not know where it's going and just yep. be like, ah. Yeah. And doing it scared. And doing it scared. Like, literally, let's hold hands with the fear and just walk through the door. Yeah. Because oftentimes, I feel like it's it's different than what you imagine it will be. Yeah. And it's and then you once you kind of cross that threshold... It's like, oh, it wasn't so bad. Yeah. It's mm -hmm. not so bad. Yeah. I think it's just human nature, too, that when you're doing something new or for the first time, it's freaking scary. You know what I mean? But can you imagine if you let the fear stop you from opening this beautiful store or from taking your first design client from when you used to stage to now being design, you know, like, could you imagine? No, I know. You That's know? the thing. I mean, I was like, I'm, I've been terrified for years now. It's almost just years. Like, yeah. It's just, just a part of We're me. just buddies. Now. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, like, yeah. Oh, here it is. I'm scared again. And I also think that as you know yourself and are emotionally regulated, you can um, increase your capacity to handle new things. But if you don't tap into your emotions and like this holistic thing that we were talking about, you kind of shut yourself off mm -hmm. and you can't do new things because you physically, mentally, emotionally cannot handle it. Mm -hmm. So if you start to heal and understand yourself and be like, oh, that's just fear. All right. We can, we know what to do with that. We have coping me mechanisms. Then you start to expand your capacity to deal and do new shit. Yeah. And that's how you keep growing as a human. Yeah. Yeah. So I want to touch back on your husband really quickly. Mm -hmm. I work with mine, but you guys work very intensely together. Like this. I mean, you didn't even want to come on here without him. <laughs> well, I was like, what are you're we talking like, yeah, about? You're like, I might need to come on. Listen, it's off brand, girl. Yeah, exactly. show up by myself. But I love that you're here. It's <laughs> yeah. so good. Yeah. So what are, if someone's looking to work with their spouse or mm. if someone is working with their spouse, mm. what are three things that you guys do really well that you think contributes to your partnership mm -hmm. and like helps to keep that partnership going because you guys truly yeah. rely on each other heavily absolutely 
You know, we get that question a lot. And I think when it comes to business specifically, not our marriage, because they're different, right? Right. When it comes to business, I'm telling you, reading that book, um, Rocket Fuel, and understanding roles and how they can be complementary, but you don't have to be both doing the same thing was game changing. Because... I can tap him in if I need help and he can tap me in if he needs help. So if I'm like, yo, wow, well, we need to we need to do this document. I don't have the time. Can you do it? He can do it. Or if he's like, I think I need a female presence for this seller so they feel more comfortable. Can you come to this appointment with me? I can do it. But ultimately, that's his role. This is my role. So understanding roles and how they work together was game changing. When it comes to our marriage, I think God created us for each other and nothing was forced. And I think when you start to, just because you're married and let's say like, if you wanted to climb Mount Everest, if Leaf didn't want to do that, don't force him to do that. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? A lot of people, I think, try to force working together when they shouldn't. Um, My first date, our first date with each other was more of an interview than a date, (laughs) straight up. We were in a different... You interviewing him or him interviewing you? It was kind of both. It was kind of both. I think we had been through a lot of stuff in our life where we were at a point where he's nine years older than me. He was ready. I know that. Yeah. He was ready to settle down. And I've always been, I think, an old soul and more mature for my age because of what I've gone through that Mm -hmm. I, I knew what I wanted. And literally our first date was like, do you want kids? Do you have kids? What is the female role? What is the male role? Like, like I'm serious, right? It was more of a... I'm laughing because I can totally see you guys doing this. Like, of course, your first date was Was business. Like, here are the things. I'm not wasting my time. Yeah. This is how I feel. I remember telling my best friend, I was like, if he has kids, I'm out. Yeah. (laughs) Because he was so much older than me. If he didn't have kids, it would almost be abnormal, right? In Hawaii, especially. I know when I met Leaf, I thought the same thing. Like, how have you not knocked up someone exactly and like how are you because i met him when he was 34 35 me too i met come on well he was a little bit younger yeah yeah okay but, but it's still. like if you make it to your 30s without a don't kid, have kid mind blown mind blown but like check you check that but yeah, yeah. so um that uh, i think helped to build the foundation of our life we were on the same page from the beginning do you know what i mean mm-hmm. and i feel like a lot of relationships start not on the same page mm-hmm. um so i think that just gave us a leg up to begin with and we constantly check in with, with each other with that and, and remembering that we actually love each other we're actually friends i he makes me laugh every single day i think that's really important and we go on lunch dates because a lot of times we can't find that date night out we Mm -hmm. with our business and then we have kids like going out seems like a chore sometimes but if we can fit little dates in during the day when we're actually working keeping that's what keeps things fresh and exciting yeah yeah, I love that. I don't know if that was three things, but no, that was perfect though. I think it was. I it's always interesting because I feel the same way about Leaf. Like mm-hmm. I feel like they didn't show it in the pilot, but I cried so much on the pilot just yeah. because I'm so. Yeah, you know what you see is I'm so raw, right? Yeah, like if I'm gonna cry, I'm gonna cry. I cannot absolutely hold it together. Yes, but that's what makes for good TV. <laughs> yeah, but they didn't show any of it. Yeah, which I'm I'm grateful now because I'm like. <laughs> I was a mess. Went, it was like the Maui fires when we were filming. So I was just like a mess. But I remember thinking like Leaf was the one who like grounded me. And I was oh so my grateful gosh. to have my partner be in my business mm-hmm. so that he could be there for that. And, mm-hmm. and you know what I mean? And I think that's the benefit of working with your spouse is like at the end of the day, you know, they have your back. Yeah. And they're your biggest fan, your biggest support. Yeah. And like a they're on the same page as you. I think that you hit on something super important because Kamai is very even keeled and he's very like not monotone, but he's stable in his emotions. He doesn't get too high. He doesn't get too low. Me, high, low, high, low, up, down, up, down, up, down. You know what I mean? So yeah. that circle. Yeah. <laughs> Almost. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> so like we balance each other out. When he's up, I'm usually flat or down. When he is down, I'm up, you know? So we are always able to balance each other out. And I think that's one thing that makes our relationship in business and just in our marriage work very, very well because we can totally yin-yang that thing. Yeah. You know what I mean? Yeah. Yeah. They love that. What is one thing that you wish you knew in the beginning that you now know? Oh my gosh, so much. 
Yeah, so much. And in, in what aspect, man? I tell you. I, <laughs> maybe let's do in like in marriage hmm. because you guys have been now married for, well, you said you were together for like 10 or 11 We've years. We've been married for eight. So when you guys first met and you interviewed each other. Yeah. Like what is something you knew now then that you wish yeah, that you knew now I that you it. wish you knew then? Yeah. I wish that I built him up more than I did because I wasn't, I hadn't dealt with a lot when we first met. And so I was so masculine and I needed to be in control of mm. everything. And I wish I peeled that layer off and let it go um, long before. And I wish I built him up a lot more as the man and leader of our family uh, sooner. Mm. Yeah. Do you feel like now he is? I think he always was. Yeah. I just f was fighting it. Yeah. Because I needed to, because I was that role in my life <coughs> for so long. No one else can do that role. Yeah. You know what I mean? And, and we balance each other out. There's, I'm still, I'm so controlling. I'm so very, I, I can just turn it off. Right. You know, so yeah. I just, I think when you are, have a man in your life that, um, treats you the way that God intended and you have a very healthy dynamic in relationship when you don't. Don't, as a woman, allow your man to take on that role more. It almost like just makes them not flourish. And you want mm -hmm. your man to flourish. Mm -hmm. Yeah. What does that look like? Like, give me an example of something that you would control before that now he controls. Oh, or not controls, but like leads. I think I wouldn't even in the very beginning. It was like, no, this is what I want to do. Mm. Versus a conversation of yeah. like... Yeah. Hey, what do you think? I respect your opinion. I agree with that. Yeah. It was just not dominating every conversation. Yeah. I love that. <laughs> and on that, we're going to end. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to ask you the questions that we ask everyone. Yeah. So if you want, I would love to know what award you want to win. But if you want an award, oh who would, who would you acknowledge? If I won an award, who would I acknowledge? And if you have an award in your room, <laughs> you want to win. I have never been asked that question before in my entire life. <laughs> if I won an award, it would be, I would want it to be for impacting lives, for actually having people, if I came into um, contact with them or I physically helped them in some way, uh, that their life was changed for the better, whether it's big or small. Okay. I think that would be an award. Um, who would I acknowledge? My family. My family and God, 100%, because I wouldn't be here without those two. I love that. Yeah. What's your favorite book and why? Oh, my gosh. I think, I like think of so many, and of course, they're all business related. <laughs> I love that. It's okay to be business related. I know. Secrets of a Millionaire Mind mm -hmm. is a very powerful book. And I think it just talks about mindset and not mindset of like bulldozing your emotions, but how, when we first started talking, I mentioned how thoughts are so, so powerful mm -hmm. and it, it really, um, helps strengthen that part of you on what is possible and, and how your thoughts are the framework to building that. I love that. Yeah. What's the best advice you've ever received? Hmm. I go back to like my history teacher when I was in high school. She was so hard on me and she was given a tough, tough road because all of us rowdy teenage girls were in her class. We had this hui of girls from Call Hill and we all had her class together. And so we made a lot of trouble in her class, but, and I felt it was so unfair at the time because she always picked on me. Because mm, you were she, the leader. She was so hard on me. Like she would let all the girls go and she would hold me back and whatever. And yeah, I don't specifically remember one piece of, you know, advice she gave or the words she said, but it was the act of holding me accountable for my actions and telling me that I was like better than what I was being. Mm-hmm. And that's just ingrained in me. So yeah. thank you, Miss Samudio. I love that. Yeah. Okay, finally, where can people follow and support you? At Kamai and Tristan on all social media. So Instagram, TikTok. 
Deals in Aloha. YouTube. And then Deals in Aloha. Yeah. Is also and then go watch their show. And then, yeah, a Renovation Aloha on HGTV. Every Tuesday. Every Tuesday. It's also streaming, right? It's also on Max. Yeah. And then anywhere you stream HGTV, like we watch it on Fubo and stuff like that. But yeah, you can watch it 7 p.m., 9 p.m. Eastern, 7 p.m. Hawaii HGTV. Thank you for coming. Thanks, Thanks for, for having me. Time. I know you're <laughs> such a busy bee. I hope this is what you envisioned. It's exactly <laughs> what I envisioned. Exactly, exactly what I wanted. I feel like you're such an inspiration to so many women. You're such a good businesswoman and such a kind person. Thank you. And I feel like I just wanted to showcase that. So Aww. I hope you did that. Same to you. <laughs> Love you, girl. Thanks Thanks for coming. Of course. Yeah. Okay. I'm going to have... Yay! You've made it to the end of our podcast. Thank you so much for joining us today. I hope you enjoyed it as much as I did. If you like this podcast and you want to hear more episodes, please like, subscribe, follow us, review, do all the things. Tell your friends. That's the best way for us to continue this journey. Thanks so much.